Hi everyone, it's Heather Darnall. Welcome back to my art ministry channel. Thank you for being here. Today I'm gonna to go back and do a traditional brushstroke painting, but what I would really like to do is to uh, recreate a recent memory from an afternoon when I spent with a really close friend of mine who happens to live at one of the local beaches here. And what I'm referencing from comes from a picture that she took of me while I was in the water, kind of out on a distant sandbar there. And as you could tell, this this day was absolutely stunning. It was gorgeous. I am so glad that she documented it and took a picture of me out in the water. And I don't mean picture of me being the focal point, rather the scenery being the focal point. So obviously today's painting is going to be a seascape. And the great thing about it is, since I'm a beginner in seascapes, this is perfect because there's not a whole lot of detail involved. There's not a lot of crashing waves or anything that can make the piece feel overwhelming. Rather, it's just uh, focusing on the coastal color palette, which happens to be my favorite colors. Um, like I said, the, the picture doesn't do this day of justice. I'm pretty sure my painting won't either. But again, it's just going back in time and honoring and praising and thanking God for giving me such a beautiful day to experience and, and just um, and always remember. Also, by the way, before I forget the shells, the seashells that we found that day and just the shells that I've been finding in general since I've been stationed here are beyond plentiful and beyond beautiful. I can't wait to do something with these seashells. So stay tuned in the near future for a video when I come up with a project to create and share with you. But anyways, um, as far as today's ministry snack goes, I couldn't think of a better or more fitting piece to put on this painting, which comes from the book of Psalms, chapter 104, verse 25. And it reads, Here is the sea, great and wide, which teems with creatures innumerable, living things both small and great. All right, let's get into this. So the book of Psalms was primarily written by King David. Other psalmists or writers include the sons of Korah, Aspa, King Solomon, and, and get this, even Moses, while the others aren't listed or do not identify the authorship. And of course, as usual, everything I'm sharing with you is given to you with the best of my current knowledge and understanding regarding the given text. But back to the book, so this book was basically written for the believers, also known as the body of Christ, which is us, and is a compilation of poems, songs, and praises. So in a nutshell, it's unpacking a ton of reflection and acknowledgement, all which contain a variety of emotions. And since I can't really describe those feelings and emotions for myself, I'm just going to say it how my study Bible lists them or breaks them down, being totally spot on as it speaks of love and an adoration towards God, sorrow over sin, dependence on God in desperate circumstances, the battle of fear and trust, walking with God even when the way seems dark, thankfulness for God's care, devotion to the word of God, and confidence in the eventual triumph of God's purposes for the world. Whew, talk about a mouthful there. I mean, that's a lot to drop. And so no wonder why passages or verses from this book are so popular. I think everyone or well, at least for me, has experienced all these feelings and emotions at some point in their life. Shoot, maybe some are experiencing them now. And so I think it's fantastic how they're all addressed, which personally makes this to be one of the more comforting books, again, for me, within the Christian Bible. However, on the other hand, some of these feelings and emotions are actually very contrary to the New Testament, which people love to point out so they can, of course, start a debate. And if you've never read the book of Psalms, or maybe you read it a long time ago, a quick partial recap is how I recall David on many occasions crying out to God for his vengeance and how he expresses his hatred. Basically how he's begging for his enemies, particularly King Saul, to have his butt handed to him, pardon my pun, and anyone else out to kill David. Yes, kill. Not to annoy and bother, but to kill. So David's wanting like, God to come down and show everyone who's boss, you know, an eye for an eye type thing, and then some. Now, according to the New Testament, when Jesus was on earth, he taught us the contrary, the opposite, to love our enemies. He has no hate speech whatsoever there. So such contraries are very understandable why the Bible can be confusing, because it says and demonstrates one thing over here and then a completely different set of words and actions over there. But listen up. Hopefully this brief explanation will settle any confusion, because remember, our God is not a God of confusion. He's a God of truth. Satan loves to take God's word and make it confusing so that you'll give up on reading it and lead yourself into self-destruction mode. He doesn't want anyone to connect any dots. And so let me connect some dots that the enemy doesn't want me to thanks to God's authority. Now, as I said, one thing that Jesus taught us was to 
love our enemies. As in, obviously, don't go out slaying anyone, just like the commandment clearly says, do not murder. You may also remember throughout scripture he even said, or at least hopefully you caught on how he said, hey, even though the commandment says do not murder, but get this, if you even desire or entertain the idea of murder and allow hatred to fester up in your heart, eh, newsflash, then you've actually violated that commandment. And the same goes for the others that start with do not. Talk about a stop us in our tracks statement. Seriously, how many times have we been so mad at someone? I know for me, for sure, you know, we're like, oh my gosh, I could literally kill that person. You know, I hope he or she or whoever, you know, falls off a cliff and becomes nothing but a stain. I mean, most of the time we say such horrific things and over the stupidest of things too. Jesus says these things to love our enemies because the commandments or laws are spiritual laws, not physical laws. They are to reflect a spiritual and or inward love and respect for God not outward. Outward words and ways mean nothing to God. Everything is about living inwardly that then floats out to an obvious outwardly life towards God, if that makes sense. I'll leave it at that now because that would be getting into the weeds and steering away from this message. But Jesus also said to be patient with those who clearly are not demonstrating living a faithful life, to show mercy and grace to others so that we may have mercy and grace shown to us and also to forgive others of their wrongdoings to us, particularly when they ask for our forgiveness, so that we may be forgiven of our sins before God the Father through Jesus Christ when we ask him for his forgiveness. Real quick here, I don't know about you, not one, but all those that I just mentioned. What Jesus wants us to do are so hard, at least for me. I'm no angel over here. I have struggles too. I'm no different than anyone else, so please, don't think of me like I'm all good over here. Let me just admit that I don't like admitting when I'm wrong. I like a fair game, so to speak, regarding one's actions. I don't have a lot of patience and my grace is far too often given out in scraps, just to name a few. As in my bowl of mercy and grace is pretty shallow at times. And when it's running low to empty, I find myself basically scraping the bottom so hard for any kind of scraps that I'm ultimately damaging the bowl. But guess what? All of these are what makes us human. These are the things, and then some, that we are now born with being born of a sinful nature. And thankfully is why Jesus is so understanding that we just, we can't help it. But that doesn't mean we're excused when we willfully sin, which is another message for another time. So if we genuinely want help, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he's there to give it to us. And let me just say, we have to want all of his help in order to be effective, to be more like him. Not just some of his help not just scraps, you know, because it, it would be no good. You don't go to, a, you know, some sort of um, addiction program to only get two of the 10 steps. It's really kind of a waste of your time. And so when we do ask for his help and receive his help, the hard things don't seem so hard anymore. They can even almost feel effortless. And so how refreshing is that, that we have the Holy Spirit as not just the helper in our wicked and defiled hearts, but we have Jesus as the savior of our souls too. So all that said, we should know, at least by now, Jesus didn't come to bring vengeance. At least not then. That's still to come. But anyway, he didn't come to hand anyone's butts to them. He didn't come to say, all right, y'all, there's a new sheriff in town. He didn't come with the club to beat down some thugs, and he certainly didn't come to take over any earthly kingdoms and our empires. He came to show people the way to live so that they may be saved, so that you and I may be saved. That was his earthly business affair. That was his work and God's invoice says he fulfilled his duties as he also paid the price for our sins, past, present, and future on the cross. And so since none of the authors that wrote the book of Psalms were around in Jesus' time is why it's more common to see writings and emotions expressed in such hostile and hateful ways that obviously do not line up with Christ's teachings. God merely desired the words of David to be written, even in such contrary ways of Jesus, so that we can not only relate to other human beings, but more importantly, it was written for us to see so that we can identify our feelings and emotions to understand that our feelings and emotions typically can get us into hot water and lead us into sin when we are not careful, hence needing Jesus. Thoughts, words, and actions matter, people. The Gospel of Matthew says in chapter 15, verse 11, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth. This is what defiles a person as in whatever comes from our hearts on out to our mouths and hands. Everything has a starting point. Know that starting point. Write that down.
Okay, finally on to the scripture. So Psalm 104 or chapter 104 was written by David, who at the time was not yet King David. But what he was doing was he was writing about his reflection. He's reflecting back on God's greatness, his faithfulness, his infinite love, wonders, and capabilities, making it very evident that he has no hate speech going on, at least not in this chapter. Again, don't forget how the various feelings and emotions documented in this book have a yo-yo effect. Sometimes it's all good, all uppity up, praising God and all, and then out of left field, it feels like there was a squirrel moment being a total drab, a Debbie Downer, let's wallow in sorrow and anger now type feeling. Again, all normal. It affirms our human nature. But just don't forget how God warned Cain in the book of Genesis when his emotions about his brother Abel were not just drab but also evil. He said to Cain, hey, sin is crouching at your door. Its desire is to control you, but you must take control of your sin. So there's another friendly warning. Now early on in the psalm, he's describing in a beautiful poetic way how God reveals himself in and through his works. Normally when I'm sharing scripture, I'm leading up to the given verse or verses so that it all makes better sense or has more clarity but with the psalms because they're more poetic it makes it more difficult to give a build up and so i'm literally just going to read what it says and then briefly go from there so starting in verse one and this isn't a long chapter or anything especially because the verses are rather short so it should go pretty quick and like i always say i feel like this is necessary to do because i keep telling you you have to know what the context is saying that it's so important to know what is said before and after the given verse or verses so that there's a complete picture. And so these poetic thoughts are a complete picture on how David is praising God in this chapter as he's acknowledging God's nature and all that he's done and how he's done all that he's done. Okay, for real now. So verse one says, bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. Now real quick, it's pretty typical for psalmists to start and end with the same thing. It's like an emphasis, although you can also think of it sandwich style, if that helps make better sense. I don't know, I'm just thinking maybe that could, you know, give a little picture there for you. But David also ends Psalm 103, starting and ending with the same thing. So here David is starting off his thoughts by blessing the Lord. So bless the Lord, oh my soul, like all of my soul is praising you. Oh my soul, oh my goodness, it's so strong. But as you can see, he's literally praising him right off the bat, blessing him and telling him how he is so great. Verses two through five says, covering yourself with light as a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. Other translations may say curtain in place of tent. And that he stretches out the heavens as far as he made them. So just like when we close a curtain or a tent door, um, it extends for quite some distance or length. And so even though you can't compare the distance of the heavens to some little curtains, it really is just to give us a picture or the image of God's action doing it. It goes on to say, He lays the beams of his chambers on the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He rides on the wings of the wind. He makes his messengers winds, his ministers a flaming fire. He set the earth on its foundation so that it should never be moved. Now, before I say another word, let it be noted that I was never into poetry and I will never be into poetry. So sometimes the wording can feel a bit wordy. It, is, it does for me, for sure. So if you're already struggling to understand, because I did at first, let that be a sign to sit and read it over several times. Besides, the Bible wasn't meant for us to whip on through it and then never open it up again. Our calling and marching orders, if we love and obey God, are to constantly be in the Word. So even if we immediately understood what was just given, we are still to read it over and over so that it becomes a part of us. It becomes a part of our thoughts and even a part of our vocabulary that ultimately reveals the true spirit living within us. But moving on, I hope you're able to pick up that David is noting how the Lord reveals his nature and works according to his ways and purposes. This passage simply sets the tone by expounding the cry, O Lord, my God, you are very great. The various images given all express the magnificence of the God who made the world and continues to rule in it. Now being clothed in splendor and majesty to me signifies how everything around him reflects more of his nature. David basically continues to say how God covers himself with light, also to me reflecting more of his nature because we all know Jesus is the light. The part that mentions messengers is very likely referring to his angelic hosts. Real quick, where it talks about the foundations never being moved. I have to just say that there are a lot of flat earth believers that take this verse as literal when that is not the context at all. This is not referring to the movement or the orbiting of the earth or lack of, whatsoever. This is speaking about how God has sent a flood. 
that he removed the waters brought upon mountains, valleys, etc., and set the boundaries of the oceans that they may never cover the earth as it once did in the flood. So during the flood, it was so violent, it literally shifted much of the land and reconstructed much of what existed to what we see today. Again, this is not an orbiting verse. This is not talking about any kind of reference of living on a flat surface type thing, being the quote foundations, unquote. It's merely a reflection of David that he happened to find valuable in noting back in the time of Noah. Anything other than this is simply Satan's usual way of distorting God's word by lying and causing confusion. I also love reflecting on this in the same way David is because every time I go to the beach, it constantly reminds me of God's control of it all, as in everything, from the world to every little detail in my life. Well, he rules over all, as in everything beyond the world too. I just say the world because the world is the only place that we know that has sin. And like David mentioned, he set a boundary for the seas. He literally spoke the waters into a fixed position. And no matter how high those waves are, no matter how hard they crash, even the waves obey his voice. So talk about another great verse to put on this piece. But in regards to the flood, let's not get mixed up with random local floods or storm surges. Those are natural disasters. And he said a lot of those would happen anyway in the Bible, all the way to end times. This also reminds me how in the Gospels, when Jesus calms a storm, the waters were roaring and wild, yet he just said, peace, be still, and it was so. That portion of scripture goes beyond his physical command, but again, he demonstrates his authority and his control just by speaking to the waters. And the disciples were like, what is this if even the wind and seas obey him? You guys, something else to consider when God mentions his control over the waters, it was written by the prophet Jeremiah. It has a different direction in the message, so I won't get into it. Like I said, it's just another reminder of God's control. But what he said to Jeremiah is flat out sad, yet piercing too, because I feel like we're no different from those people God was referring to that he was so upset over. So listen to this. Your mouth is about to fall open. Your lungs may even feel short of breath. Chapter 5, verses 21 through 25, God is dishing it out as he says, Hear this, O foolish and senseless people who have eyes but see not, who have ears but hear not. Do you not fear me, declares the Lord? Do you not tremble before me? I place the sand as the boundary for the sea, a perpetual barrier that it cannot pass. Though the waves toss, they cannot prevail. Though they roar, they cannot pass over it. But this people has a stubborn and rebellious heart. They have turned aside and gone away. They do not say in their hearts, let us fear the Lord our God, who gives the rain in its season, the autumn rain and the spring rain, and keeps for us the weeks appointed for the harvest. Your iniquities have turned these away, and your sins have kept good from you. Remember, God's word is for all generations, and we are clearly seeing that we are right up with the people of Judah, and God is definitely not happy with us. But boy, oh boy, count your blessings because talk about some patience he has. Like I said earlier, it's only a matter of time now before he comes again, as in when his patience runs out. Verses 6 through 9 says, You covered it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. At your rebuke they fled. Uh, they is referring to the waters. At least that's my best guess because it's most fitting or makes the most sense. But anyway, it continues to say, At the sound of your thunder they took to flight. The mountains rose, the valley sank down to the place that you appointed for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass, so that they may not again cover the earth. This is excellent proof right here that the flood was not localized as so many people believe. If it was, then God would have told Noah to take a hike and then wait it out for a bit to then come back. Also, if it were only a localized flood and God promised to never make it flood again, then that would make him a liar. Like I already mentioned, the Bible says there will be more natural disasters to come, which include localized floods. And that's by his grace that he even says that. So hopefully by now you can see everything clearly, but more importantly, truthfully. All that said, you can see more how David is describing the flood and everything that I touched on earlier. This section also stresses the reliability of the world that God has made based on the third day of creation, where the land and the water become separate and for a reason. The dry land is a safe and suitable place for its inhabitants that are yet to be spoken into existence. Verses 10 through 24, I'll skip for the sake of time, but I will give a quick summary as they speak to how David goes on with more wondrous descriptions on how God's work is revealed within our world, all the surrounding beauty, his love and care for everything he created, from the grass to the animals to his most special creation, mankind. 
He also speaks on how he made the moon to mark the seasons and the sun to know it's time for setting and so on and so on. Okay, we have arrived to the star verse here, verse 25. Here is the sea, great and wide, which teems with creatures innumerable, living things both small and great. Now it's obvious that what I'm about to paint can't measure up to what was just said. But I love how that what I'm about to paint can at least set the tone, give an idea of not just its beauty and God's control over the waters, but just how much actually goes on under those waters. How many creatures actually exist in there? Innumerable is right indeed. But anyway, so after all this talk about God's care regarding his creation, mainly speaking to everything on the land, this part also mentions his love and care for the sea creatures too, and not just the popular ones. And again, I love how David says, here is the sea, great and wide. He's acknowledging the vastness of it, the depths of it, what lives in it. And like David just noted, what lives in it is innumerable, but so are the creatures as the land animals and flyers, both small and great. I mean, God's level of creativity is, I, uh, I, I, I guess I have no words. My human mind is ultimately limited on trying to expand on what David said because I'm in that much awe. Living on the coast has been such a blessing to me. I'm constantly reminded of God's nature, his love and care for all of his creation, how I'm just a speck compared to the oceans, and moreover, how our earth is merely a speck in his eyes too. Yet he chooses us, teeny tiny us, to be his favorite. Let that sit with you. Now I'm going to read the remaining of the chapter that extends on to verse 36, which won't take long, and I won't go into depth about them, again, for the sake of time. I'm just reading them so that you can see how David continues to poetically acknowledge and honor God in all of his ways, as it reads, There the ships go to and fro, and Leviathan, which you form to frolic there. All creatures look to you to give them their food at the proper time. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are satisfied with good things. When you hide your face, they are terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. When you send your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He who looks at the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. May my meditation be pleasing to him as I rejoice in the Lord. But may sinners vanish from the earth and the wicked be no more. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. Other translations say, bless the Lord, just like it said in the beginning as well. But that's what I'm talking about. A lot of psalmists will start and end with blessing and or praising the Lord, which is really the same thing. You bless him when you praise him, and when you praise him, you bless him. So either way is pleasing to him. All in all, hopefully this has made you put your thinking cap on or at least tighten it a little more to get you to really try to understand the beauty of not just David's words, but the beauty of God's nature. Again, poetry is it's not my bag, but when it comes to the Holy Trinity, man, it sure puts things into perspective, at least for me, and becomes a whole lot easier to digest and certainly appreciate. All right, guys, let's get in and get started. I'm beginning my project using a 16 by 20 flat panel canvas that has some painter's tape at the top to separate where I want my sky to end and where I want my waters to begin. For the sky, I'm using the colors pale blue at the top and titanium white at the bottom, and I'm gonna fill it in with my one inch tip flat brush. As you can see, I'm starting from the top and working my way down, going back and forth, and then gradually going back up again to make sure my colors are nicely blended in. Once that's dry, I remove the tape and place it into the sky portion so that my seed colors don't get mixed in or cross over the line. After I've washed my brush, I'm starting with the furthest point of the waters being the deeper waters using the color Prussian Blue Hue followed by a Thalo Green right underneath it and blend them in just as I did with the sky colors.
When I have my deeper waters in, I wipe my brush and load it with a little bit of pale olive green and an emerald green to start the lighter shades or shallower parts of the waters. One thing I love about Florida beaches is that the shallow waters can go out quite a ways, which is obviously what extends the beautiful greenish blue colors. You'll notice that this whole painting is basically working my way from the top to the bottom and that there's a lot of back and forth movement, even some up and down to ensure my colors are blending in. Also that I use a combination of the flat side of the brush as well as the chisel edge and that I'm not focusing on achieving straight lines within the water. To me that wouldn't make the sea or the waters look very realistic and so I want to make sure that there's some movement within the composition by brushing a little more freely I guess you could say. You can use more or less of the colors that I'm using or entirely different colors altogether. I'm just trying to recreate the scenery I was enjoying as best as possible. Take note though that I'm also including some unbleached titanium within my color palette to represent not just the dry sandy areas, but where the shallower waters are that obviously indicate the sandy bottoms in the waters in which you can see I'm trying to paint one right in the middle. This was meant to indicate that distant sandbar that I was walking back from to the shoreline in the photo. Again, take notice that the darker colors represent deeper spots and that's why I'm painting in some patchy areas by using darker colors throughout and play around to see what I like.
Here I'm incorporating some custom blue fluid paint throughout the waters. I thought it would serve as some nice highlights, a little more movement, and that it would soften up all the green some. I mean, the Emerald Coast where I live is literally called the Emerald Coast because the colors are not far from what you see, and hopefully the photo says it all. But I still think it would be nice to add a little more color variation in there, which I do just using the chisel edge of my brush and going from side to side. Now onto the sandy area or where the water breaks. Here I'm taking a little bit of neutral gray number five combined with some unbleached titanium and I'm just contouring the edge of the water and then try to blend a little bit of the water in with the wet sand, but not too much. Next or below that I'm using only unbleached titanium to indicate the sand being a little more dry. You know that damp packed sand look followed by unbleached titanium mixed with a little bit of titanium white to show completely dry sand as well as to show some gradient lines within the sand. My gosh, that's a mouthful. I hope I'm making sense. Anyway, Florida is known for white sandy beaches and so that's why I added some white to help make it look like more of a Florida beach. Although I hear the Caribbean or the Bahamas isn't much different if it is at all.
Okay, after all that gradient talk, hopefully you can see those lines within the sand now, but here I'm gonna get extra creative with this part. I'm taking my spatula and I'm spreading a thin layer of a light molding paste across the very bottom of my canvas, which you may or may not see, and I apologize if you don't. Uh, my camera arm is only so high to get only so much in view, but it's, it's really no more than a couple of inches at best. I'm not making it even other than the thickness. I really want an uneven look. So I'm continuing this uneven look for a purpose, just as you saw me paint in uneven lines in the sand to make it look more realistic, just like the lines in the water. Once I'm done spreading the molding paste, I'm gonna take some sand that I took from the beach and I'm slowly releasing small amounts of it onto the molding paste, as in I'm letting small amounts come out from the bottom of my hand that is mildly gripped, if that helps give you a visual. And I'm gently patting it in so that it will stick in there. I also think this will help give this painting some depth and literally give it a sandy look. And a thin layer of molding paste like this should be completely dry in a few hours, but I think the longer the better, as in maybe like a day. Next, I'm taking a small flat shader brush and I'm using the chisel edge of it to gently paint in where the water meets the sand, or to better see the water highlighted along the edges, and to paint in some super tiny waves that also adds more color variation and of course a little bit more movement. Notice I'm only doing sections, although you can do it however you want to. You can add more waves, bigger waves, no waves. It's really up to your comfort zone and your skill level, but either way, a seascape, I believe, is still beautiful with waves or without waves, big or small waves, whatever. I mean, you just can't go wrong. But to soften up the waves some here, I'm just dabbing them in a little bit with my number six round blender brush. Also take note that I paint in a mix of my neutral gray number five and my unbleached titanium under those waves for shadowing. And here it is. Hopefully you notice the sand and see how it gives the painting a much more realistic look and feel to it. I've added sand to a painting before and don't worry, it doesn't dribble down or make a huge mess. It actually adheres to the molding paste quite nicely, but if you keep touching it and messing with it, then you're asking for it. But I just love the colors of the water. I love how calming it looks and I love the less is more look. And like I said earlier, it doesn't have to be all complicated. It can be very simplistic and still look really good. And here it is framed. 
what a great finishing touch at least I think so it almost even looks like I'm looking out of a window well if only that were my actual view but oh well God has us in the house for a reason and that's good enough for me well, that's the end of this demo, and if you liked it, please be sure to not only share it, but to also hit like and to subscribe for more videos. But more importantly, remember to thank God for this opportunity and to always paint from the soul. See you next time. Bye.